As John has just said, my name is Eric Rodriguez, and uh, firstly, I'd like to um, really thank the organizers for allowing me to present this research, which has both been the culmination and continuation <coughs> of my master's dissertation, which was conducted at the University of Southampton and the Center for Maritime Archaeology uh, this past year. So before we talk about the re actual reconstruction of the landscapes themselves, make sure you at this point. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, before we talk about the landscapes themselves and the reconstructions behind it, I would like to talk about the background, discussing both the past and present archaeological investigations that are going on, as well as the more environmentally driven paleogeographic modeling that has been done uh, back in 2000. Uh, once you have this background set, I'm going to discuss my own modeling efforts and my reassessment of the area itself, discussing my research goals, and just really try to open a communication about the updated recent variables and methodologies that are currently used in this process. Um, I like to also put, the, put this, um, this environmental work in the context of an archaeological framework. And so with that, I'm going to be looking at settlements and finds on a GIS spatial analysis on, on these recreated landscapes. We'll discuss the results, and then I like to talk about the implications of this work for cultural wetland studies for both the Humber estuary and, of course, in general. So, here are the Humber wetlands. They are located on the eastern coast of northern England. We have the River Humber, which is right here, this lovely big river. And this is actually one of many uh, large inland waterways which are responsible for draining one-fifth of England. Um, the whole system uh, is once, was once a dynamic landscape but now in a complex delta system. But unfortunately, due to uh, medieval land reclamations, embankments, canalizations, and large system drainage. Um, the area has been described as flat and featureless and called outright boring. Um, the first large scale, I mean, the first large scale archaeological investigation began in 1992, but we have archaeology that dates all the way back to late antiquity. Uh, but this was carried out by the Humber Wetlands Project by Wessex Archaeology, and it ended in 2000. Um, from this large project, as well as some of the other smaller finds, we were able to pull out some very important contributions to British archaeology. The first of which are the Ruskar figurines, which have tied religious connotations to prehistoric landscapes and these wetlands in general. Additionally, we have the Farabee Boatyard, um, our five boats and a paddle, of course, uh, dating from the late Bronze Age all the way through the Iron Age, and they remain one of the earliest examples for prehistoric watercraft that we have in England. Additionally, to the south of that, we also have the Brig Raft, which ties this, the, the whole estuary together as a large trade network, utilizing these maritime or these waterways in general. Uh, during the Humber Wetlands Project, there was also findings of Bronze Age trackways, which show that as these wetlands were created through rising sea level models, uh, or rising sea levels, um, that the prehistoric peoples actually still continue to interact with these landscapes. And there was an importance on there that extended beyond economic or possibly ritual. Um, going into the past reconstruction techniques, um, there are small paleo-environmental um, areas that were carried out by the Humber Wetlands Project, but the largest regional level was carried out by the Land Ocean Evolution Perspective Study, LOAPS, which was a branch of the Land Ocean Interacting Study, LOIS, which was then commissioned by the National Environmental Research Council back in 2000. And this was led by Shannon and Metcalf. So while the first attempt was a really strong first, um, first approach, there are some concerns that we have for these reconstructions. And I'll show you the images in just a second. The first thing we have to focus on are actually the natural time scales. These are slices at a thousand year intervals, which have allowed them to not be as more compatible when looking at the archaeological data sets as well. So there is a little bit of friction when we're looking at integration between archaeological data sets and these environmental factors. Additionally, there's no regional variation. If you look at the southern holiness right here, that area, the paleo-environmental work done by the Humber Wetlands Project shows that this area should actually be flooded and inundated with a lot of glacial lakes or mirrors that were left over. However, in these models, dating all the way back to 8,000, we see it looks relatively similar to what we have in the modern landscape. So there have been some concerns. Some things that these, uh, these models have done correctly um, was the involvement of palynological data or the wildlife itself. So we actually can see the formation of peatlands, uh, the eutrophic wetlands, 
and <coughs> even forced in some, in some cases. So the 2014 efforts that I took were based on one simple question. How can the application of updated paleogeographic modeling approaches contribute to our understanding of the dynamic phenomenologies of the Neolithic and Bronze Age communities of the Humber Estuary? So to do this, I decided to take those disadvantages that Metcalf's models had and decide to rebuild them with the more archaeological focus. So, so we can study anthropological um, focus. We have the 500 year interval <coughs> instead of the 1,000 year, so we can observe closer. Um, I limited my date range from the 6,000 years ago to 3.5. Uh, this, this concerns the uh, late Neolithic to um, the late Bronze Age period. And it was the incorporation of eustatic and isostatic factors as well. So some of the data sources I ended up looking at were about 270 boreholes for this, um, a large set of radiocarbon peat samples taken from both Lois and the Humber Wetlands Project. Um, instead of using old topographic maps, we got, were able to uh, use LiDAR-based DEM with a one meter resolution, and the incorporation of the glacial isostatic adjustment model, which is probably the most vital aspect to this, because not only does it take into consideration the, rel the rising relative sea levels, and it also takes into consideration the crustal uplifts of the British plates. While these first four factors are all great for the paleogeographic side of it, we want to also tie in the archaeology as well. This is where the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age settlement database comes into, comes into play. And this was really an assemblage from a, a wide group of sources, everything from Wessex archaeology, English heritage, and the volumes of the Humber, the Humber Wetlands Project in general allowed me to create a very large database, and we'll see that a little later on. So the second goal that I had was to highlight the regional variations, especially when it came to the southern holderness and even the estuary itself. So the two study areas that we saw are Farabee, which is north and south, right here. So this is the area of Farabee. We have North Farabee here, which is where we see um, the Bronze Age trackways as well as the Farabee boatyard. And then we have the south as well right here, and this is all the Ferby area. Here we have the Southern Holderness, which consisted of Roos Carr, Keenham, and Halsham. And this one, even though the archaeology here isn't as significant as you would find in Ferby, it was chosen for the paleoenvironmental work that had been done here. Like we had mentioned earlier, we had the Southern Holderness had not been modeled correctly, and there was no evidence for mirrors in this area. So hopefully revisiting this area with new data and a larger data set, we're actually able to create a better or more accurate model of what the landscape would have looked like. So, in addition, uh, once these giant areas had been produced through ArcGIS and Rockworks, I was able to develop four classifications for the areas. We have open water, subtidal plains, which is basically uh, sedimentation of the areas. We have the intertidal uh, eutrophic wetlands and the salt marshes, the drier salt marshes. Here's some of the first results for the Ferriby study area. At 6,000, we see wetland formation all along the edge here, and even in the Alcombe Valley. Um, in 5.5, we actually start to see the sedimentation that starts to occur in this area. And this carries on for 4.5, 4,000, and 3.5. Now, these maps are not perfect due to the borehole spread and dist distribution. We see some areas, especially around the edges here, Whereas there is evidence that those areas would have been connected to the larger waterway systems. Instead, they're viewed here as, well, wetlands. For the Southern Holderness, there wasn't as much uh, peat sampling, so we couldn't create uh, a full range dating all the way back through the, uh, through the Bronze Age. But we are able to see the <coughs> Neolithic evolution of the area. Uh, we have the inundation of the region, which shows off the glacial mirrors that are in the area. We have wetland development in 5.5, and then even further more sedimentation around the same areas here. Okay, here are some of the models that I produced very recently, actually. This was the 4.5 uh, landscape based, um, this was done with arc scene. And here's the southern holderness around 5,000 as well. And we can see that we have successfully placed um, the mirror location based on these rising sea level models and the GIA itself. So from this, 
From this, we were actually able to calculate rates of inundation, wetland exposure, and regional sea level curves for the area. But where's the archaeology? So to build on this, I decided to use GIS analysis of the archaeological finds and, expand and yeah, settlements in the area and see what we can do through extraction of these values of these general areas. So ultimately, little change occurred. We only see the, uh, the inundation of two Neolithic sites as well as no change at all with the southern holderness. However, we still getting implications for the dynamic relationship of prehistoric settlements and the proximity to rising sea levels in the Humber in a very dynamic landscape. Here we have the distribution of the sites. Uh, for the North Fairview, we have the Bronze Age sites here, which are closer to, the inner closer to the intertidal wetlands, whereas the Neolithic sites are settled more along the dry salt marshes. And I'll show this in another image. And here we have a larger spread of continual occupation in the southern holderness. However, this ranges again all the way back to the Mesolithic even. So the results of therapy, once I've isolated the factors, we were able to see that they do reside in the salt marshes, which focuses on the deforestation and agricultural development that had been characterized for much of northern England's Neolithic scene. Um, in the Bronze Age, however, we do see this movement towards the intertidal wetlands. And this may, be, this may indicate that there's been increased marine activity, whether it's through trade, ritual, or even um, subsistence patterns with fishing weirs being found in the area as well. For the Southern Holderness, most of the, again, because we were unable to get to the, to the Bronze Age timeframes, we were only able to focus on the Neolithic sites, and these all reside in the intertidal eutrophic wetlands, which may show that in this area, they decided to resist going to the agriculture, instead settled for the dependence on uh, maritime subsistence patterns. So from this paleographic modeling, we can see that it's possible to examine, even quantify, areas of human activity. And it's very dynamic environment as it changes. So in the future investigations for paleogeographic modeling, um, it really helps with the study of multiple scapes, because wetlands themselves are a paradox. They are considered one landscape for, in many minds. But at the same time, there is a wide range of low to high biodiversity, and even UNESCO's their Ramsar sites, which are designated for wetlands, shows a variety of 41 different types. With paleogeographical modeling, we can also, is it possible that we're seeing the creation of ritual landscapes? Are we seeing um, areas that are now flooded and abandoned, but still have that ancestral tie that they may want to revisit, even do bog bodies, which has been seen in Scandinavia during the same time period? And it's this intimate relationship that we can see rhythm and rhythm analytical understandings of how the human environmental relationship works. Um, with this, um, the, we have some future investigations for the Humber. Um, we do need additional surveys. There needs to be a lot more coring and radiocarbon dating of peats to create wider ge paleogeographical modeling. Um, using these landscapes, then we could even do probability mapping for more prehistoric sites, whether they are more boat yards, or even trackways. Uh, integrating the paleontological data will give us a better understanding of the actual scapes that were being utilized for this area. Again, because there are so many different types of wetlands. Were they peatlands, or were they more eutrophic wetlands? And again, this will add to the larger prehistoric North Sea cultural wetlands understanding if it is tied in with possible uh, contributions with the Scandinavian wetlands that we see on the other side. But my acknowledgments, uh, I'd like to thank Fraser Stewart primarily for teaching me a little bit about the paleogeographical modeling, the HER, um, the Humber Archaeology Partnership and the University of Hull, English Heritage, Wessex Archaeology, Geomatics Group, the BGS, and of course the University of Southampton for housing me for all this research. Thank you. <laughs>